This morning, we continue our summer series on reimagining the family portrait. And this week, we turn our attention to family trees. Many of us are using the new science that is bringing our family trees into perspective. If you've taken 23 and me, raise your hand. If you've done Ancestry.com, raise your hand. If you've done both, raise your hands. Sometimes we do both, hoping to get another, another idea of who we might be. Well, the chances are, if we've done that, we have learned more about our heritage than our ancestors could have imagined. Our family trees may end up containing a few curious revelations. It might alert us to our long-lost third, fourth, or fifth cousins. Generally, not that exciting. It might tell us that our ten times great-grandfather bought a chunk of land now known as Brooklyn. But don't try to claim that through a quick claim deed anytime soon. It might even reveal that we have royal blood. But if you tell me you're sure that you are related to Prince Harry and his son Archie, I'm going to have a hard time believing you. For some of us, the information that we are learning from these tests is exciting. It's even life-changing. For others, these revelations are unsettling and produce results that alter our lives in significant ways as they alter the way we see our families and ourselves. Many of us have found ourselves thoroughly shaken when we learned that one of our parents was not our biological parent. Others of us have discovered half-siblings we didn't know existed. For some of us, the science that brought our parents the ability to have children has now shown us a multitude of siblings that come from a single sperm donor. The science today is moving faster than our ability to understand and to cope with our changing family trees. It can cause us sometimes to wish we had never taken that dadgum DNA test in the first place. I've thought that a lot lately. And while there is much to lose by learning the truth about all the sordid details of our family tree, perhaps there are also stories that might expand our understanding of our interconnectedness and the ways in which we can begin writing a new narrative about who we truly are. Mark read this morning the beginning, just the beginning, of the narrative of Jesus found in the Gospel of Matthew, which sets the stage for the birth of Jesus. Matthew knew his audience would be retelling this story for generations. And while the names are ridiculously hard, that's why I only made you read the first portion, the beginning of this narrative of Jesus in this manner, the writer was very careful because he knew that it helped his audience and now us begin learning who Jesus was. This litany of identity, which reads in many ways like all the other genealogies found in the Hebrew Bible, is unusual in that it includes five unexpected names. Names that usually would have been left out. Names of people you and I probably wouldn't have told stories about. People on the shadowy side of the family or the ones that came from the wrong side of the tracks or that bad sheep that you would prefer remained in the barn. But the writer of Matthew trots them all out. Granted, the entire litany contains the usual luminaries that we hear about all the time. There are also, though, five women on this list. Women were not usually included in these genealogies because the family name, the tribal name, that name passed through the fathers. But here, unlike nearly every other genealogy in the scriptures, the writer of Matthew chooses to include these women. And they're not the noted patriarchs that we might expect. 
Instead, folded into this story and this family tree are Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary. Like many family lores and legends, we only have a small portion of the stories of each of these women. The stories of two of the women, Tamar and Bathsheba, are pretty much R-rated as they're written in the scriptures. And taking into consideration our Sunday morning community often includes younger children staying in worship with their families. We're going to bypass their stories, but believe me, they're quite interesting for the PG-13 and above crowd. You should read them. In the book of Joshua, though, in the Hebrew Bible, we first meet Rahab. She is a Canaanite woman who has the starring role in the success of the Jericho conquest by the Israelites. After the Israelites had wandered in the desert for 40 years, they came to the place that they believed God had promised them. Rahab's story, which is also a little R-rated, is an integral part of the establishment of their homeland. It's an intriguing tale because, first of all, Rahab is a prostitute who just also happens to be a successful military strategist. She easily recognizes and chooses to side with the Hebrew people. She acts bravely to save her family from harm. And the words attributed to her, the words have this theological clarity that the two Israelite spies she's working with could not even begin to comprehend. Understand, there really is no room for a woman like Rahab in the grand narrative of the Hebrew people. One wonders why she simply wasn't edited out of the text. And yet there she is in the book of Joshua and in the genealogy of Jesus. So Rahab, the Canaanite, married an Israelite and gave birth to a son named Boaz. The next woman we know a little better. Ruth was also not an Israelite. So theoretically, she was not supposed to be married into the family tree. Ruth wasn't part of the chosen nation of Israel. She wasn't descended from Abraham. No, Ruth is a Moabite, and Moabites trace their lineage back to one of the daughters of Lot. If you grew up in church, you grew up in the Hebrew scriptures, you know that their mother was the one that was fleeing from Sodom and Gomorrah and turned to look back and turned into a pillar of salt. I don't know how they have a picture of that in their family tree, but probably not easy. Through some sad events that change the direction of Ruth's family tree, she finds herself a widow living in Bethlehem with her mother-in-law, Naomi. She meets a man named Boaz who happens to be the son of Rahab. And in a rather bold act, proposed by her mother-in-law, Ruth essentially proposes to Boaz and marries him. And eventually she becomes the great-grandmother of King David, a major character in Jewish history. While Ruth's story is not as scandalous as Rahab's, she is a woman of non-Israelite descent. Or as many like to inappropriately say in our country, she is a foreigner. She wasn't from around there. She might have been undocumented. She might have come across the border seeking asylum because she was a widow without a family. She had no future in her homeland. And yet, there she is, front and center in the genealogy of Jesus. Some scholars have suggested that these rather interesting women are in the genealogy of Jesus to prepare the readers for the scandal of Jesus' origins. Mary's extraordinary conception of Jesus simply made this family tree get a lot more interesting. Just in the last few months, I have come to understand personally how complicated a family tree can become. And at times, I haven't taken it very well, quite truthfully. Yet I've realized in new ways, these family trees are not abstract diagrams of our genealogy. They 
they are, in fact, filled with living, breathing human beings who are longing to know where they came from. And while it might be disconcerting for me, it might mean the world to them. I was especially drawn this week as I worked on the sermon to an article about a man who has embraced his family of children. When Tim Gilkinson began donating sperm to a bank in 1989, he never expected to meet his biological children. He never imagined renting a 15-passenger van to take them to Bass Lake every summer. He never envisioned the kids hiking, playing pranks, and competing over silly games they invented together. But this month, Tim will continue what has now become an annual tradition. He will rent that van, he'll fill it with food from Costco, and take the kids to Bass Lake in the Sierra National Forest for a week. The kids are now 18 to 25 years old. Some of them have, becoming, have been coming to Bass Lake for over a decade. The article about Tim and his children appeared last month in the Atlantic. It is a story of hope about the new American family portrait. We shared on social media this week a photo of some of his kids at the lake last year. It's a photo of young people who decided they wanted to understand their family tree. But more importantly, they wanted to know each other. One of them said finding Tim was a bonus. For a 52-year-old gay man who is a real estate agent in San Francisco, the decision to donate sperm after reading about lesbians looking for donors in a gay pride magazine in San Francisco has brought to him a tree he never could have imagined. If these kids and their dad and their moms and all the rest of their families can find goodness, in the new portraits of an American family, I am hopeful we can all follow their lead and open ourselves to who might appear in our family tree. Knowing our roots is about a sense of belonging, of grounding ourselves in family. But even if our family trees are not the fairy tales we hope for, excuse me, we hope for, I think that by finding this community, we have an opportunity to find that sense of belonging. The family tree of Jesus is many things, but most of all, it is about the inclusion of the many roots that came together to make the human family. Each week in this place, I am so very grateful for the radical inclusivity that allows us to dream the past and remember the future together. We remember where we are from in hopes that it will help us understand who we are as we find the road ahead. And on that road, we will share this life together one step at a time, one day at a time, as we continue to invite others to join us on this journey. May it be so. May it always be so. Amen.